Hi, I'm Mark Feldman, Senior Staff Engineer at Qualcomm Technologies, and today I want to talk to you about Vulkan Memory Management. Vulkan's promise of improved application performance comes with a caveat. You, the developer, will need to do more work for what used to be the graphic driver's responsibility. One aspect of this work is memory handling. The portion of this large effort that the graphics driver used to handle in OpenGL is now an additional effort for you in Vulkan. There are basic issues with memory that you're using, how much to allocate, where to allocate it from, and how to handle getting it from the CPU to the GPU. Vulkan has explicit methods for controlling this. There are three related topics I want to cover in this talk related to Vulkan memory management. Pooled memory for allocating heavyweight Vulkan objects like command buffers, descriptors, and queries. Host memory, how to get the computer system memory in Vulkan and device memory, how to use the device, that is the GPU's own memory in Vulkan. There are three classes of Vulkan objects that are allocated in pools. Command buffers, those instructions that tell Vulkan what to do. Descriptor sets, basically shader resources. And queries, information and statistics about Vulkan processing that can be returned from the GPU. In general, pools help handle memory allocation. Memory pools can elegantly handle fixed size memory allocations and avoid problems like fragmentation that happen with variable size allocations. Vulkan pools are single threaded memory allocators. They are not thread safe, so you need to allocate one pool per thread. For example, it's common in Vulkan to have multiple threads building command buffers at the same time. Each thread could have its own pool. As you allocate these objects from the pool, memory allocation is handled efficiently for you. Vulkan keeps track of the allocations from the pool and has the ability to do a bulk reset, returning all allocations back to the pool in a very efficient manner. You create and destroy these pools using VK create command pool, VK create descriptor pool, and VK create query pool, API calls, and similar destroy calls. There are a few differences between these pools that we'll cover next. A command pool is used to help track your command buffers. There are two flags to use when creating command pools using VK create command pool. A transient bit, which indicates that the command buffers allocated from it would be short-lived, perhaps for a single frame or even for a single queue submission. And a reset command buffer bit, which indicates that the command buffers from the pool can be individually reset. When the reset command buffer bit is set, you can reset individual command buffers with VK reset command buffer. Command buffers are also implicitly reset when calling VK begin command buffer. You can also bulk reset all of the command buffers in a pool by calling VK reset command pool, perhaps at the end of a frame once the command buffer has been submitted and executed. Just a word of warning, make sure you are indeed done with all the command buffers in the pool before resetting. You can and should add synchronization objects when submitting command buffers to a queue to be notified when they'll be completed. You should also double or even triple buffer the command buffers as part of a larger effort to keep the GPU busy. When creating descriptor pools, there's a flag VK descriptor pool create free descriptor set bit, which allows descriptor set allocations to return to the pool individually. There's also a few creation parameters to define the maximum number of sets that will be allocated from a pool, and a set of sizes that define the descriptor types, basically images, samples, uniform buffers, and counts of those descriptor types that will be allocated from the pool. You allocate descriptor sets with VK allocate descriptor sets, and you free individual descriptor sets with VK free descriptor sets if that creation flag is set or the entire pool in bulk with VK reset descriptor pool. Queries are very small in memory and homogeneous, often just a 64-bit integer per query. It doesn't make sense to manage them individually, so the Vulkan API allows them to be allocated in pools in contiguous allocations. When creating queries, there aren't any creation flags like the other pools. You need to specify which query type be it occlusion, pipeline statistics, or timestamps that the pool will allocate. No mixing of types per query pool. There's a pipeline statistics bitmap to fine tune the exact counters when querying pipeline statistics. You use queries within a command buffer, and they are started and stopped in a command buffer with VK command begin query and VK command end query calls. 
You can reset the queries using VK command reset query pool, which allows for a range of the queries to be reset. This next section will cover host memory, memory that's on your computer and not on the GPU. Your application can allocate system memory that will be used in Vulkan using a callback system, which generally requires you to call malloc. But a strong word of caution for those using host memory allocation callbacks. These should not be used when optimal performance is needed. The most common usage scenario is for debugging and logging and memory usage. Writing a good memory allocator is hard. You should presume that the driver is already doing a decent job with allocation and don't feel compelled to improve on this or simply wrap malloc for your own allocator. Many of the Vulkan APIs accept allocation callbacks like VK create instance shown here. Unless you've implemented your own system memory allocation scheme, just pass a null value for the allocator and don't worry about using this host memory feature. Note that there's a hierarchy of allocators, one for the Vulkan instance, device, pipeline cache, and object. Each of these can have separate allocators defined. When using callbacks, when you create an instance, the instant allocator will be called. When you create a device, the device allocator will be called. When you create an object, the object's allocator will be called. In general, on Adreno, the most specific allocator that's defined will be used. If it's not defined, the driver will walk backwards from the object to the device to the instance to find an allocator that is defined. The allocation callback structure has several pointers you'll need to set. User data is a pointer value that will be in the first parameter passed back to the callbacks. You can change this value every time an allocation callback is passed in. Next, there are three function pointers in the structure for allocation, reallocation, and free. These are functions you'll define to allocate, reallocate, and free memory for the Vulkan object this callback will be called for. Then there are two function pointers in the structure for notifying you about internal allocation and freeing a memory that the driver is doing. There's nothing for you to do, it's just a notification. You'll just need to write the allocation, reallocation, free callback functions. For these callback functions, you'll see that the user data parameter is returned. It might be helpful to use this parameter to understand exactly which object the callback is being made for. For the allocation and reallocation callback functions, there's a size, alignment, and allocation scope value that's passed back. Make sure you obey the alignment request. The allocation scope will either be command, object, pipeline cache, device, or instance, and indicates the lifetime that the allocation will have. Also, keep in mind when using these host allocators that the destroy functions in Vulkan take a callback structure. You should pass in compatible allocators for both the create and destroy functions of the same type of object. The driver may also make internal allocations and will not be able to use your host allocators for performance or some other reason. You'll be notified via these internal allocations and freeing callbacks, but aside from perhaps logging the information, there's really nothing for you to do. Finally, let's talk about how to create memory directly on the GPU device. This is memory that will be used for Vulkan resources, primarily buffers and image views. Most of the resources on the GPU need memory allocated for them. So keep in mind that Vulkan separates out the resource object from the memory that the resource uses. Vulkan will require you to write a memory allocator. We'll talk more about that in a second. Now there are only a few APIs to manage device memory. To allocate, use VK allocate memory. To bind the memory to the Vulkan resource, use VK bind image memory to bind images or VK bind buffer memory to bind buffers. And to free memory, use VK free memory. Now here is where device memory gets a little bit tricky. Device memory is organized into heaps with different memory types. A heap is a memory resource of a particular size. Your device memory allocations are taken from heaps. A type is a set of memory properties that can be used with a given memory heap. The heaps have different types of memory. Once you have created a Vulkan physical device object, use the VK Physical Device Memory Properties API to see what memory is available in your GPU. The VK Physical Device Memory Properties structure returned will describe the heaps and the types that are available. 
The memory types array contains a bitwise set of flags describing the mix of properties for that memory and a heap index where that memory combination or mixture is available. There are five memory properties which can be combined. Device local, which is most efficient for GPU device access. Host visible, this memory can be accessed directly by the host by using mapping functions like VK map memory. Host coherent, with this you won't need to flush or invalidate calls to make the host writes visible to the device or the device writes to the host. Host cached, the memory is cached on the host, which means it's a little bit slower to access. And lazily allocated, that the memory is only accessed by the device and is only allocated when actually needed. The heaps array will contain the byte sizes and a flag for each heap. The flag VK memory heap device local bit means the memory corresponds to the device local memory. At least one heap will have this flag set. Now let's look at an example involving heaps and types. There are five types of memory that can be combined in types, local, visible, coherent, cached, and lazily allocated. So in our example device, it could contain four types of memory combinations which can be accessed in four separate heaps of different sizes. So taking our example device, it could contain four types of memory combinations which can be accessed in four separate heaps of different sizes. Type A, only local memory is available in heap 0. Type B, visible and local memory, is also only available in heap 0. Type C, local, visible, and coherent, is available in heaps 1 and 2. And type D, cached, is available in heaps 2 and 3. On Adreno 4X and 5X GPUs with our current hardware and drivers, there is only one heap available with lots of memory. Adreno is not a discrete GPU with its own limited memory, but is rather integrated and has its own access to system memory. There are three types of memory available. Type A, local memory, type B, local, visible, and coherent, and type C, local, visible, and cached. Type A may be more suitable for render targets and textures. Type B might be suitable for mappable buffer memory used for staging buffers. Type C might be suitable for CPU reading. Vulkan guarantees that at least one memory type is host visible and host coherent, and one memory type is device local. Finally, let's talk about the steps on how to create and bind the memory used directly on the GPU. This is the memory that will be used for images and buffers. Call VK get image memory requirements or VK get buffer memory requirements to get a VK memory requirement structure. The requirements will include the size of the memory, the alignment, and the memory type bits. Memory type bits is a bit field and contains one bit for every supported memory type for the resource. Bit i is set in memory type bits if and only if the memory type i in the VK physical device memory property structure for the physical device is supported for the resource. Finding the appropriate memory type is a matter of searching through the possible types, checking to see if it's supported for the resource, and if any additional requirements are needed. One commonly used requirement is to make sure the memory is host visible so that it can be written to. Also, only use memory types that are actually needed for the task at hand. Don't overspecify the properties, especially if you have code that needs to run on different hardware with different memory types available. In our Vulkan SDK sample framework, there's a short routine called get memory type from properties which illustrates this memory type selection process and could be a starting point for your needs. After the heap is determined, the sequence of calls could be VK allocate memory to do the allocation of the device memory, VK map memory doing a men copy, and then VK unmap memory to write directly to the memory providing its host visible of course, VK bind image memory or VK bind buffer memory to bind the memory to the Vulkan image or buffer object. And then later on during cleanup, VK free memory. Although the previous steps of allocating and binding are the most direct and simplest to code, they are not the most efficient. Memory allocation is an expensive process. The OS generally allows for only a limited number of allocations. You can check the max memory allocation count member of the VK physical device limits for an idea of the limit. This could be as low as a few thousand. 
Also, every memory allocation is tracked by the driver and the system. Also look at the buffer image granularity. VK Allocate Memory allocates page line memory, and at least on Adreno GPUs, we have large page sizes, so the potential is there for some wasted memory. If max memory allocation count is exceeded, VK Allocate Memory will return VK error too many objects. Doing suballocations is a smart strategy since it minimizes the overhead of memory allocation and wastage. Reusing allocations is generally a good idea. You'll generally make a single VK allocate memory call to get a block of memory and then manage the sub allocation yourself using a block offset parameter when calling VK bind memory. And don't be shy about creating large allocations. Our heap size is close to the total amount in system memory, so it's rare that you'll see a VK error out of memory. Given that there are several types of memory types you'll need to utilize, you might allocate one block per available memory type that is, perhaps one for mappable memory and one for everything else. A more refined strategy could include having different memory blocks for different sizes and lifetimes, immediate, per frame, or even per game level, or a pool for linear allocations and one for large allocations. Vulkan does allow you to share memory between objects, but given the effort in trying to keep this in sync and not being able to modify objects that are in flight in the queue, Making sure that both objects are not in use at the same time and trying to write one object while another object is being read, it's just not recommended. The general advice is take time to incorporate a well thought out memory allocation scheme for your app. The payback will be worth it. This tutorial provided an overview of memory management in Vulkan. Now you've seen how the various pooled memory objects work, how to allocate host memory, but mostly just for debugging and logging purposes how to allocate device memory, and how to sub-allocate memory allocations, and seeing that it's a worthwhile effort. Thank you for watching. We hope you enjoyed this video. Please visit the Qualcomm Developer Network to learn more about graphics and tools on Qualcomm's mobile hardware.